Hi everyone, I'm Luke Hector and you're watching The Broken Meeple. This is a YouTube channel about board games where I give reviews, top tens and my honest opinions regardless of the consequences. Get on with it. So on today's episode, thanks to WizKids for the review copy, I'm taking a look at Rebuilding Seattle and this is a game that's come out fairly recently. It's had a decent amount of coverage from some reviewers, particularly Bull Grogan. He's done solo tutorials and gameplay reviews of it and I came into this pretty much blind because other than his solo playthroughs and that, I didn't have much understanding of what this game was really about and I don't remember checking out many other reviews on that besides because cover wise it didn't necessarily appeal to me but I thought you know what it's getting a bit of buzz I'd like to know more and so I decided to jump into this particularly as I tend to like polyomino games which this one is definitely kind of big on the question is is that actually a gimmick is it actually part of the game and <laughs> does everything else work well we'll have to see Rebuilding Seattle is essentially a city building economic game. You each have your own industry board where you have various tracks that you are leveling up in terms of quality. These can score you at various points during the game, but you also have to track them on an amenity track as well as your city population. What you were doing effectively is that you start off with a little player board, which is basically got some pre-printed little uh, buildings on it, essentially Tetris shapes. And what happens is that during each round, of which there are three, there is a ton of these cards laid out, which essentially give you an extra tile, but may give you some endgame bonus, upgrade your quality track, or increase your amenity tracks and get you more tiles or extra money in the income phase at the end of a round. But all of these are available on a big board, which represent the prices. And if you have more players, well, then you have more cards available. And they tend to range from between three to five bucks. But Basically, the game is fairly straightforward. In each round, you have a choice of three things to do. Buy a tile, which could be one of these basic cards here. It could be a pre-printed one on the board, or it could even be a landmark tile, which essentially is one of two cards that you'll have at the start of the game, which could be anything like an airport, a public library, a state bridge, whatever. These are more expensive. They score you points though, and don't build them at your peril because you really do want to build one of these. But that's just building you basically pay the money and you stick it on your board and try and fit it in the space but you can also build more space so you just bolt it on there you go a couple of little suburb tiles there and now it means that i can put this t-shape right there but then you can also trigger an event these events are the same every round there are six of them and they'll do things like score the various tracks that you have or get bonuses of money or reduce population but all six of these are in every round and if somebody takes the sixth one the round immediately ends so this is a tension game timer effectively but when these get triggered is going to be different in terms of uh, you know value for everybody and scoring the quality tracks involves you comparing your amenities amount with your population and for each shortfall you have to basically reduce the you know the amount of reward that you get but you know these are quite a neat little feature on top of that, you also have three laws on your board, which are asymmetric with the players, and you can activate one of those laws each round, and they get you some cool bonus, but you have to pick which one of the three you're going to do in a round, and of course, everybody's got slightly different ones, and if you don't activate it before the round ends, well then, tough, you didn't get around to doing it. But that's the three actions that you have, but the game just continues around in that fashion until the six events have been triggered, then you have some income, and then you clean up a bit, and then you rinse and repeat for another two rounds, and then total up the end game points and see who wins pretty straightforward overall and certainly from a rule book perspective pretty straightforward I mean this is the rule book this is all it is you have a reference on the back and I think you even have a round summary and reference card in front of you which is decent enough I mean you won't get all the rules from this reference card but you'll certainly get the majority of what you need from here but the rule book is literally just this here's your setup here's two pages of the rules here's the other two pages including the solo rules and endgame scoring and there's your reference sheet. That's it. It's literally about three and a half to four pages worth of rules beyond the setup. It's a pretty straightforward game to grok, which is great because I'm getting sick and tired of everything needing to be a 30 page rule book and really, really complex these days just for the sake of it. This one knows it doesn't want to be stupidly complex. That being said, there are one or two hindrances in that regard. Firstly, the setup. Yeah, the setup is a page long of text and a setup diagram, fine. But this is a game that quotes 60 to 120 minutes on the box. Oh boy, yes. Um, if you play this game with a lot of players, you will take a lot of time to play this game. I mean, 60 minutes is not 
60 minutes is how long it should take you when you play it by yourself or with two players. But when you play it with three or more, you're going to hit more to the 90 minutes to two hours mark. And five players can certainly go to two hours plus if you're being really slow. But for the most part, you should be playing this in about 90 minutes. That's kind of on average. The setup for this, though, is insane. I mean, even for a two-player game, this, you know, that should only take you about an hour, an hour and a quarter. The setup for this is like a 20-minute time frame, possibly more so. It's ridiculous. You've got to set up everybody's little player board. Then you've got individual, like, player uh, spaces that you need to draft. Then you're supposed to set up all of these tiles by shape and colour, of which there is a considerable amount of them. This is three bags full, six different colours, three or four different shapes apiece. All of them set up by shape and colour? No, God! No, God, please, no! No! Get stuffed. <laughs> I bag them up and then I just keep them in there and when somebody wants a piece, you take them from the bag. Trust me, this will cut your setup time in half. But then you still have to set up the events and then dish out landmark cards and then you need to have the pair board, sorry, the main board with the various cards littered out. And there's like about, you know, there's something like 10 to 12 of them on the board as it is. If you play with more than two players, you have to put one of these extensions out and then you have to put in another seven cards per extension. It's kind of ridiculous. This is a table hog through and through, which is not something you expect when you see this game, especially when you take some of the pieces out or when you read the small rule book. You read this rule book and you think, well, this is a fairly simplistic game. Boom. It's all on the table. Not to mention that even though the rules aren't complicated, the amount of options that you have in this game is very overwhelming for new players. Because, you know, the main board, I forget what the main board's got. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. There's about 11 or so. Yeah, 11 cards are laid out that you could buy for a two-player game. 18. 25. Birdie. Oh no, I've gone cross-eyed. This thing gives you so many cards when you add the players that even though the cards are not complicated in themselves, there's only about three or so types, four max, you still got to look at all that and process it all. And for anybody who's not used to this type of game, it's going to blow their minds wide open. And not in a good way. This thing will just overwhelm new players. And I certainly don't recommend it for light gamers. Even though that the rules are fairly light, there's still just too many things for you to look at and process and choose. Which, why couldn't that have been condensed down a bit? That just seems a little bit insane for how much there is. Now there's a lot of tiles, as you can see. So you think that the polyomino aspect is a big deal. I wish I could say that was the case, because frankly, the polyomino thing feels kind of tacked on. Does anybody remember a game called Pipeline? You know, I see no one play that game anymore, and yet people apparently say it's a great game. No, it's not. It's average at best. Don't like Pipeline. In fact, I would call it below average. I didn't like Pipeline at all. But in that game, it has a bunch of economic stuff, la la la, and then this little thing where you put tiles together to create line of pipes. That bit is so tacked on in that game, it's unreal, but it tricked me into thinking, oh, there's going to be a cool tile lane, but oh, is that it? And that's the thing. Here, it's the same deal, because 90% of the time, you don't care where things go on this thing. You're trying not to cover the various symbols, because at different times during a game, those symbols will trigger and they'll get you something cool. So, okay, avoid the symbols. Other than that, you can care less how you arrange the tiles on your board. And mainly, it's just a space thing, because once you run out of space, you just grab more of these, of which they're pretty easy to acquire, and then you just fill up those spaces and try not to cover too many symbols if you can help it. But you don't care which blue goes next to a green or if keeping the oranges together or anything like that, unless a card specifically says so and they're not that common. So for a whole game, you could play this game without caring where any tile goes other than covering symbols. So suddenly this whole thing of, I've got to separate all these by color and shape and have all these tiles available to buy and all this, feels like an arbitrary element, which is a shame because it's kind of a big element of the game in terms of the time it takes. In terms of your options on your turn, I mean, building the building cards is cool because there is a lot of them out there, but really the main fun part is the events because even the laws on your board, yeah, you've got three little asymmetric powers that you can use, but you only use one around, so you're only going to use max three in a game, and okay, fine, they're nice, but that's kind of it. It's just trigger a unique power once out of each round. Really, the events are probably the more fun aspect, 
but this is still not something new and it's something that you know it's not going to make the whole game for you but it is a cool turn tension timer where you're not entirely certain how long the round's going to go because as soon as the sixth one is taken that is it it's a bit like the bell cards in Argon the Consortium. You know, you don't know how quickly those bell cards are going to get taken and when the round might end. So if somebody triggers one event, fine. Two, okay, fine. Three, oh, we're starting to get there. Four, oh god, where's the round going to end? Five, ah, don't take the sixth one next. Ah! You know, and these, in which order they trigger, are pretty cool. And they give a little bit of a bigger bonus to whoever triggered it. And then everybody gets something. So there's a reason to trigger these besides simply just moving the game timer along. But these are a cool aspect and I do like it, but this is a small aspect compared to the whole polyomino thing, and I just wish that maybe there was a bit more reason to have polyomino Tetris tiles. Don't drop that, dear! Aww. Paths to victory are a little bit limited in this as well though, because there's not a lot of different paths you can take. There's only three main types of buildings for the purposes of these quality tracks, and you will not be able to level them all at the same rate because there's just not physically enough money in the game for you to be able to afford all that. So you're probably gonna gun ho on one of the three colors. Pick one. I mean, two of them give you the exact same reward, points or money, and one of them just gives you points. I don't know why they differentiated like that, but I think it's because the orange tiles on the the cards tend to give you more money in the income phase because restaurant income, I mean, that makes sense. So I think they tweak it in that respect. But you're going to base deciding, right, I'm going to focus more on pink, orange or blue. Pick one and go from there, I guess. It, and you can decide that at the start of the game, but you'll probably distinguish that based on what cards you buy in the first round. But you're not going to get all three of them up to level five. That's just physically impossible. I have never seen that happen. And if you are getting those quality tracks up to level five, chances are your amenities are so low that the height of the bonus doesn't matter because you you know your amenities are so low it's not going to matter you really are kind of just doing the same thing each game even with the landmarks i mean landmarks are fine and all and they might give you some other thing to aim for which you know might actually care more as to how many landmarks do you have or whether you have more tiles of a particular one and the landmarks are probably the only thing in the game that actually care about putting a particular type of tile next to a certain color but if you don't have one of those landmarks at the start of the game then again you just don't care about tile placement and really the end game scoring cards are just you know a point per tile of a certain color and that's kind of it there's no other real variation in it so you play this game multiple times and it doesn't feel that different from game to game. The three arcs, like the three game rounds effectively, play out exactly the same. The only difference being that you might have a little bit more money in you know, the later rounds and the third round will introduce the end game scoring cards whereas the first two rounds won't. But it doesn't feel like it's going through an arc per se. It's just get more of these, put some tiles on. Oh, I need more, put more tiles out, get more room and decide kind of what color you're going for. Now I've talked a lot in the past about games being multiplayer solitaire and this one is not quite as bad as some of those ones, but it's still not exactly an interactive game. I mean, apart from someone taking your card, that's basically the main bit of interaction other than the game timer with these events. That's basically all the interaction there is. None of the scoring, as far as I'm aware, in the landmark cards cares about your opponents. None of the end game scoring round cards care about your opponent. So really, the only thing that does care what your opponent is doing is these six events and whether they take your card. But, you know, in a multiplayer game, because there's so many of the wretched things out there, it's kind of hard for someone to take your card because there's so funny many of them. But it just makes this game not that interactive and certainly you know they put five players on this box to sell more copies. There is absolutely no reason to play this with five. All these cards out and a two hour time frame for what is a three page rule set? No, I'm sorry, that is way too much. How many times do I have to say it? I've exhausted that meme by now. Five is right out. I don't really want to play this with four. There's not much incentive for me to play it with three. I mean, three is not too bad, but I'd probably just rather play this with two, free max the solo mode is identical to the multiplayer mode all you do is you have a small deck of cards you flip one over and it means that a card goes away or an event card gets triggered that's basically it you don't score for an ai or anything you just have to reach a target of 120 points now granted i like the fact that it's a target not just beat your own score you have to get 120 points but it does kind of gear you as to like playing in a certain way in order to get that many points but yeah, the solo mode plays out basically exactly like multiplayer, which makes me think, well, why am I playing it multiplayer? The uncertain nature of when these events will get taken 
is the same in solo as it is multiplayer. You know, for a barely a tiny little deck of cards and it makes the multiplayer almost redundant. So rebuilding Seattle is not exactly the big hit that I thought it was going to be. It's fine, but I've been seeing a mix of opinions. The, you know, the Dice Tower review did a mixture of opinions and it went from 6 to 8 to effectively 9. You know, I don't do decimals, that's stupid. But, you know, we're talking 6, 8 and 9. And, you know, that's quite a wide disparity. And Rado, who loves everything, you know, puts this as one of his top 10 games of the year, you know, and, and certain other creators have also done pretty high remarks, but then some have also done, eh, it's okay. Paul Grogan loves this one as well. I think it's fine, but with all that hype, all that buzz, I was expecting more. And this one just isn't really grabbing me as much. It's fine, but that setup is such a chore. I don't want to play this with more than two players, frankly. I pretty much will just play it solo. And do I really want to play a game that will take me 45 to 60 minutes with a 20 minute setup time? But I do like the tension with the event cards. That is a pretty good, decent, solid thing. I do like the fact that you do have a few paths to aim for based on your landmarks, but again, that's you know very dependent on what landmarks you get. And having a slightly asymmetric board and only a three page rule set is all good. I do apologize if there's a bunch of noisy kids out there. Suburbia, what can you say? But the, it, the problem is, is that it doesn't really grab me. And if I have to tell people, oh, by the way, I need to show you 30 plus cards on the table for a four or five player game, I think most people would want to walk away from this and I don't frankly blame them. This is mainly a solo game with a tiny little bit of multiplayer thrown in and it's fine. I'm giving this overall a 6 out of 10. 6 is still above average. I still think it's fine. I'll play it. But I'm going to be picky about who I play this with. I'm going to be picky about how many players are in it. And chances are I'd rather just play it solo if given the chance. You know, the solo mode is multiplayer without all that time but then you've got to set the game up which takes forever as well so you're kind of damned if you do damned if you don't and that is a bit of a hurt on the game it's not bad at all but i do question 9 out of 10 10 out of 10s for this you can't ignore the setup you can't ignore the player scaling issue you can't ignore the tail table hog thing and you can't ignore the fact that the polyomino thing is for the most part pretty redundant it, it's got some issues and some quirks that would easily drop it below a distinction level and you know i'm just not getting 9 out of 10 for this it just doesn't make sense not a bad game at all but the buzz just isn't grabbing me it's a 6 out of 10 above average i'll play it i recommend you give it a try maybe try before you buy but it's not one i can give a seal to so that's it for me on this episode of the broken meeple if you like what you see then please thumb it up on youtube and thumb it up on board game geek when it goes live on the site don't forget to check out more content on the show including the war of the ring card game that i reviewed as well as the barcelona review i've done from board and dice and of course don't forget to leave your comments down below you've probably played this game by now do you love it do you hate it i think it's going to be quite a divisive game in terms of opinions what am i missing here that makes it a 9 out of 10 for you i'd be interested to know but of course let me know your thoughts from a multiplayer aspect as well i mean are you only playing this one or two players in which case i can understand but if you're playing this with four or five players regularly i'm sorry i don't get the nine out of ten nine out of ten ten out of ten marks you're gonna have to explain that to me but you know different strokes for different folks so until next time remember regardless if you live in quiet suburbia or in a neighborhood with noisy children it's still only a game bye for now everyone